Hi everyone and welcome to this week's War's End History Story. This week I am covering the history of Willington Mill and the Old Mill House. This is about the flour mill, not the rope works, which I will cover later. This will also possibly be a little shorter than some of the more recent stories that I have done as there's not a massive amount of information about the flour mill or the mill house. But I still wanted to tell the story as it is part of the history of War's End, so I hope you will still enjoy it. It's more than possible that a mill of some kind stood on the site of the current building in the 1700s, as one was mentioned in 1750. However, I am only going back as far as 1800 for this story, as earlier information is a little hard to find. In 1805, a newspaper article was advertising the mill and mill house for sale. The mill was described as being a steam mill situated at Willington Quay and that it was a little worse than new. In other words, it wasn't very old. It had been built in around 1800 and the original owner, a Mr Robert Oxen, is also said to be the man who had, had the mill and mill house built. The article says that it has been carefully looked after so it is in excellent condition. Mr Oxen and his family had previously lived in the mill house and Mr Oxen is even going to show interested parties around the mill, by appointment only, of course. Although the house is included in the sale, there is very little detail in the advert other than to say that it is a good dwelling house. I believe it had 12 or 13 rooms inside, over three floors and attics, and would have been quite a good-sized family home. Some articles claim it had a cellar, but based on information given by Joseph Proctor, it didn't. It stated that the mill was built from the most approved plan of Bolton and Watt. Bolton and Watt were the men responsible for designing the first ever steam flour mill in London in around 1786. And it also says that Willington Mill is 88 feet long, 27 feet wide and 56 feet high. The land it stands upon is on a 21 year lease and there are 16 years still remaining on that. It's also described as being one of the completest mills in the kingdom. The article was quite clear that the mill was certainly worth viewing and it is often referred to as she, as in she was seven stories high and designed for seven pairs of millstones. Steam flour mills were still quite new, but they were said to be much more efficient than the old style flour mills. Due to the running from steam engines, they also did not need to be built in isolated locations which no doubt helped with staff being able to get to work. It's said that due to their use of coal, some were even built quite close to collieries to save on costs of transporting the coals to the mills. However, this also made them unpopular in some areas, as the old-style mills ended up going out of business. And it is said that when the mill in London burnt down, workers of other mills actually rejoiced as it meant they would now have more work. I have no idea how many interested parties went to view Mill Willington Mill, but the first new owner that I know of was George Unthank. It seems that Mr Unthank lived and worked there for several years, quite happily, and in around 1829 he was joined in the business by Joseph Proctor. Joseph and George were cousins and the families were all Quakers and very well respected in the neighbourhood. Joseph Proctor married a lady named Elizabeth Carr in around 1831 and he then moved into the mill house and George Unthank and his family moved to Battle Hill Farm. Several of Joseph and Elizabeth's children were actually born at the mill house. George retired from the business not long after this and it was then left to Joseph to run the mill on his own. The mill, it seems, soon became known in the area as Proctor's Mill. It was a very busy place and the engines are often running late into the night, sometimes until around 2am. I don't know how noisy they would have been, but I do think the houses close by would have been able to hear this in the otherwise still of the night. I am assuming, as I do not 100% know this, that the staff will have been on shift work, but it is also possible that they were expected to just work very long hours, similar to the hours worked in the cotton mills. Health and safety was not a thing then, so the idea that people might have been tired of long shifts was not something mill owners would have considered, which did no doubt result in some accidents, 
although I have not been able to find any details of any for Willington flour mill. The mill itself is doing well and all is good. However, the family are not happy as they are having a lot of problems with the mill house. Now, some of you may be aware that I recently covered the haunted mill house in a video and I plan to do a follow up with more stories in more detail next week. So I won't go into too much detail about it here, but it's safe to say that the haunted mill house was causing the family a lot of problems sleepless nights and the loss of staff, along with the children being frightened a lot of the time. One of the rumours circulating at the time claims that before the earlier mill was built, a lady had lived in a cottage on the land and had died, and then she had been buried in the grounds of her cottage. This was sometimes embellished with the story of her being a witch, and saying that she had to be buried here as she could not be buried in the churchyard, due to her being a witch and of course this was now the site of the new mill however the mill was not said to be haunted so it seems that that story didn't really fit with the problems of the house and another story that was circulated at the same time was that two people had been murdered near the mill house in 1806 neither had apparently ever been identified and some say these were connected to the hauntings at the house but despite searching, I have found no real evidence of either of these stories, unless anyone listening can find anything out about them for me. But these problems with the mill house finally led to the family moving out in around 1847. And although they moved out of the house, the flour mill remained open. It was looked after by the mill's foreman, Mr Thomas Mann. There were houses close to the mill known simply as mill houses, and I believe that Thomas Mann and his family would have lived in one of these. It's hard to know for sure where the mill houses were, but looking at old maps you can see buildings quite close to the mill, which may have been the mill houses, but this is not definite. Once the Proctor family were no longer living in the mill house, it was rented out. It was separated into two homes, and the Thomas Mann family and the mill clerk and his family, I believe the clerk may have been a man named Edward Elliot, both lived there. They lived in the house until the mill closed and seemingly had little or no problems with any ghosts. Just as a little extra to add to this, Thomas Mann died in 1870 and is buried in St Peter's Churchyard with his wife. It's not clear why Joseph Proctor closed the mill. Perhaps he was just ready to retire or perhaps he was not making as much money. But whatever reason, he did so in 1867. He then rented both the mill and the mill house to another miller from the local area whose own mill had recently burned down. Now, I don't know which mill this was and I haven't actually looked into it, but maybe somebody knows which mill that would have been. This was just a temporary arrangement and the mill and house were again both soon empty, so Joseph Proctor put them both up for sale. Whether the mill had any brief tenants is not known, but it does seem to have taken quite some time to sell. I did read one article from someone asking when it was going to be used again, as they felt it looked like it was falling down. The mill was eventually taken over by a Mr Sampson Langdale in around 1871. I would assume that he also bought the mill house. The house was then split into tenements and although no details are known as to how many people lived there, no one seems to have been disturbed by any ghostly goings on. The son of the previous owner, Edward Proctor, did describe the house in later years as rather sad and pathetic looking and nothing like the splendid family home he remembered living in with his parents and brothers and sisters. He described how the stables and outhouses were gone, the garden wall had been removed and all the lovely pear trees had gone. He described it as being rather squalid and unappealing. Back now to Samson Langdale and the old flour mill. Mr Langdale had for many years been in the chemical manure business and had recently sold his Newcastle business for some £90,000 and it seems he had a desire to create soap in the old flour mill, and he spent some considerable money in altering the workings to do this, around £20,000 in total, which apparently would be around £3 million in today's money, so it was a very big investment in something so new. 
It seems Mr Langdale, however, was no stranger to taking risks and spending money on a business that might not go well, as he had previously been bankrupt in 1848, and I believe that this was from a business that had been a flour mill, oddly enough. And it seems his soap business was one that didn't go well either. Although he had backers in the area and workers willing to try it, it would seem from local reports that he was once again bankrupt by 1874, owing considerable sums of money to many creditors, and the mill was once again empty. It would remain empty until around 1885 when Hood Haggy took it over. They already owned the Willington Ropery close by, so this was a nice addition to their business. They used part of the mill for the production of wire ropes and the rest was used as a warehouse. The mill, as I said earlier, was seven storeys high, but it would seem that during its time without an owner or a tenant it had fallen into disrepair. And I have to admit to being unsure if it was actually Hood Haggy or Samson Langdale who reduced its height to four storeys, but it, this was done and it then ended up with a more domed roof. And I wasn't able to find any details at all about the alterations. And later, the area which housed the steam engine and where the chimney once stood, which you can see in the photo on screen at the moment, was completely demolished. The newer, smaller building is the same one we can see today. The old flour mill, now part of the ropery, remained in use for many years to come. Of course, Haggis is long since gone, but the mill is still used by Brydens and is now used by them as offices, which I'm sure I have mentioned in other videos in the past. It is probably one of the oldest buildings in that area that is still standing and still in use. I don't have an actual date for when the mill house was demolished, but it is no longer there and hasn't been there for many years, and the area it once stood in is now a works car park. I do wonder if the car park is haunted like the house once was. I hope you have enjoyed this short story about the mill and its house. As I say, there's not a lot of detail, but it is still part of the history, so I did want to do a story about it, and I do hope that you have still found it interesting. Thank you very much for watching, and I do hope to see you all again very soon.